focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, uh, joining us in the studio, our Tuesday reporter is Kwon Soa and Che Ji-hee back in the studio. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. All right, uh, let's start things off with President Yoon suk yeol and uh, him attending the G20 summit as part of his uh, final schedule in the itinerary of the visit to the two Southeast Asian countries. This beginning, of course, last Friday, uh, we covered uh, some of his itinerary there. Uh, let's get some updates on the key agendas and uh, some of President Yoon's remarks there. Jia, you have more on this. Right. So after his visit to Cambodia, President Yoon took part in the G20 summit, which kicked off today. Uh, the summit held under the theme Recover Together, Recover Stronger was hosted by Indonesia this time. And among the three priority sectors that the summit focuses on, which are global health, architecture, sustainable energy transition, and digital transformation. Uh, Yoon delivered speeches during the first and second sessions, which dealt with food, energy, security, as well as health, respectively. Uh, there, he proposed to move away from protectionism and seek solidarity and cooperation when the global community is facing food and energy crises. Uh, President Yoon first mentioned how all member states took part in the standstill of the trade and investment barrier that South Korea had proposed back during the first G20 summit, which was held in 2008. And then he emphasized that all members should combine efforts to ensure there are no irrational exports and production measures that undermine the stability of global food and energy prices. Uh, Yun also called for a green transition in the food and energy sector. He stressed that the international community must put in efforts to build an eco-friendly and sustainable food and energy system, uh, and that innovative green technology development and exchanges in these developments must be made at the G20 level. And then the president concluded by saying that as South Korea has a history of overcoming hardship through food aid received in the past, uh, the country feels the responsibility to return what it had received by providing rice aid and contributing to the international community as well. Uh, the G20 will become a platform in which various state leaders meet bilaterally and multilaterally on the sidelines of this two-day event. And normally a joint statement that combines the different opinions of each member state is presented after uh, this summit. However, there are doubts about the nation's, uh, the all the member nations' ability to reach an agreement on this joint statement as there are differences in views over, in particular, the Russian war. Uh, and since there are conflicting interests among countries uh, regarding all the agendas, the topics that are being dealt this time, mm -hmm. this seems to be quite challenging. Meanwhile, the importance of the occasion would determine if the spirit of global co coordination can be restored and provide a glimpse of the future direction of global cooperation. And President Yoon, uh, after his participation in the summit, is scheduled to return to Seoul early Wednesday. All right. So uh, before he does uh, return to Seoul on uh, Wednesday, uh, we briefly talked about this on our headlines uh, today. He is sitting down with his Chinese counterpart Xi Jinping for a one-on-one -on, -one, uh, on our yesterday's program. By then, at the time, uh, there was no scheduled one-on-one -on -one sit-down uh, with Xi Jinping. And uh, remember, uh, Tan and I were talking about how uh, it, and uh, Po Gyeong was here, we were talking about how uh, would have been nice if the two leaders finally sat down. Of course, uh, Xi Jinping hasn't been making any of these overseas trips during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it is only recent that Xi Jinping has uh, making visits. I, I believe uh, he visited uh, Kazakhstan not too long ago. And of course, now he's attending this G20 summit. And we're saying it would have been nice if they could hold a one-on-one, -on -one, talk about North Korea-related issues and, of course, other issues at hand here. Uh, at this time right now, it is 6.07 uh, p.m. here in Seoul, South Korea, which means uh, the summit should have started by now. So uh, tell us more about this. Right. Uh, the summit uh, was scheduled for 5 p.m. Bali time, which would be 6 p.m. here in Korea. So uh, it was not before this Tuesday morning that South Korea's presidential office revealed 
President Yoon and Xi will hold a summit. Uh, so unlike earlier expectations that they might just have a natural encounter, uh, it's going to be the first official bilateral summit between the two. So uh, if they were on time, maybe they are already shaking hands as we speak. Yeah. And uh, I was pretty surprised uh, by this uh, as well, because the last time uh, I was here, we talked about uh, how officials mentioned that it's probably just going to be uh, a natural mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. engagement just on the um, sidelines. Right, right, right. A pull aside, mm-hmm. uh, I would say. Uh, so the two, it's their first uh, in-person meeting, and uh, they only had a phone conversation conversation at the end of March, uh, which means that was uh, during the presidential race when President Yoon was actually not elected yet. And it's also the first time in around three years that a summit between the two countries uh, is taking place. The last time she met with a South Korean leader was with President Moon Jae-in. And SJ, as you mentioned, she hardly went abroad in the past three years and had hardly any visitors from abroad due to COVID-19. Right. So with that, President Yoon will have had uh, one-on-ones with his counterparts from not only the U.S. and Japan, but also China. So all key countries involved in Korean Peninsula issues uh, during his two-leg trip in Southeast Asia. Uh, Speaking of the Korean Peninsula, North Korea's nuclear threats are expected to be a main agenda during the talks between Yoon and his Chinese counterpart, uh, probably missile uh, threats as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yoon may ask for Xi's more active engagement in resolving the nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula, and with that, he would want Xi to side with uh, the just recently adopted joint declaration between Seoul, Washington, and Tokyo, uh, as there, Yoon, Biden, and Kishida had agreed to jointly respond if the North conducts a new another nuclear test. Uh, and that was, uh, of course, an agreement made in Cambodia on the sidelines of the ASEAN meetings. Uh, and uh, also, uh, it's... Um, the the uh, the fact alone that the two have decided to uh, ha- hold an official summit makes sense because uh, President Xi is also expected to meet with Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida on Thursday. That's also going to be their first in-person meeting and that on the sidelines of the APEC forum in Bangkok. So, yeah, it looks like President Xi is uh, trying to... Uh, have all of these meetings uh, while he is now abroad. Yeah, and and you know what? Uh, at the time when uh, there was no discussion about Xi Jinping holding talks with neither Yoon or uh, Kishida, we were saying that uh, this was surprising because uh, if you even read, uh, for example, like the Global Times, right, Chinese back uh, Global Times, one of these some of the articles that they've been covering is like they're not a big fan of South Korea and Japan and U.S kind of holding these talks because they feel like the U.S. is leveraging uh, their power to kind of help South Korea and Japan uh, over the uh, the North Korea nuclear threats and then try to, you know, get them straying away from China, right? And then we've been hearing about how if you read, uh, if you kind of break down Yoon's remarks recently, it does seem like they're kind of going closer to the U.S. alliance rather than China, although we would say that, you know, the Yoon administration at the time, uh, they're trying to balance it as much as possible. And so now that China is seeing that they're kind of leaning more towards the United States, they need to get back South Korea, they need to get back Japan on their side a bit, uh, which is why they're holding these talks. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if North Korea is, again, and, and China could use North Korea issue as a leverage to get uh, South Korea kind of on their side as well at this time. I, you know, China is one of the few countries that North Korea uh, still listens to. But there's the THAAD issue. And the, the THAAD issue, and then China has been long been trying to remove THAAD here in South Korea. But, you know, that can't be done without uh, any discussions with the United States. So it's all going to get very complicated. Again, we have no idea what the discussions are being held right now because it's just started. I'm sure as we get more information throughout the day, uh, throughout the evening, we'll, I'm sure, cover this uh, tomorrow. Uh, in the meantime, Prime Minister Han Duk Su uh, will be participating in the APEC summit uh, slated for the 18th and 19th. Uh, and uh, Chi, you have more details on this. Right. So according to the prime minister's office, Minister Han will visit Bangkok later this week to attend the 29th Asia-Pacific Economic 
Cooperation Summit. Uh, he will leave for Bangkok on Thursday for this event, which is uh, to take place on Friday and Saturday of this week. And according to the office's statement regarding the PM's uh, participation in the occasion, during the summit, Han is expected to discuss measures to strengthen trade and investment in the Asia-Pacific region, as well as inclusive and sustainable growth. Uh, the APEC summit was canceled in 2019 due to the then-host country Chile's domestic reasons and was held virtually for the past two years, of course, because of COVID-19. So this will be the first in-person summit in four years. And Han will emphasize APEC's leading role in responding to climate change, restoring the multilateral trading system, strengthening supply chains and connectivity, as well as introducing Korea's efforts for participation at the APEC plenary session. And as an expert in trade and diplomacy, Prime Minister Han is also expected to contribute to the recovery of the multilateral trade system based on the 12th uh, WTO ministerial conference, which was held back in June, and the progress of the free trade area in the uh, Asia uh, uh, a free trade uh, agreement in the Asia Pacific region and discussions on growth from a macroeconomic perspective. And Han will also make efforts to seek international support for South Korea's bid to host the 2030 World Expo in Busan and will hold bilateral meetings with his counterparts on the sidelines of the summit. And Prime Minister Han will stay in Thailand, uh, the host country, until the 20th before returning to Seoul. And he will be officially accompanied by a number of key political figures, including Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs Lee Do-hun and the Ministry of Trade's Director for Trade Relations An duk as well. Uh, the summit is composed of two plenary sessions, an informal dialogue, and a luncheon between among the heads of uh, all the APEC members as well as Thailand, and a dialogue with the APEC Business Advisory Committee. Guys, uh, l- let's turn to one of the big uh, sideline events of the G20. Uh, although maybe some of us, uh, or just maybe myself, uh, really hope that uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin was going to be attending the G20 summit, and uh, it was going to be a lot of leaders either boycotting his presence or uh, U.S. President Joe Biden possibly wanting a one-on-one with Putin. Th- that's not happening because Putin's not there. But a uh, bilateral summit between U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping, that did happen. Uh, as we said before, uh, the two leaders had only held phone talks before five times before. This is the first time they're holding one-on-one face-to-face talks since Biden became the president of the United States. Um, so uh, let's get some uh, comments uh, as we had the details coming out after our program yesterday on what Washington statements are following this uh, summit talk. Sure, but uh, before we uh, before I get into the Biden Xi summit, just a quick update on the mm-hmm. Yun Xi summit. Okay. Uh, it looks like the press is not allowed to cover this meeting. It's behind closed doors with no on mic remarks. So not even opening remarks seem to be coming out uh, currently on site. And uh, both presidential offices appear to have agreed on that. So. Th- I guess it's not an update, but it's an update on that we're not going to have updates in the next few minutes or so. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> goodness. Uh, which probably means that uh, we're just going to get uh, some press releases yeah. either from the White House, mm-hmm. right? I'm sorry, uh, the Blue House, or yeah, yeah. I should say the presidential office. Yes. <laughs> Keep, oh my goodness, I, I'm still not <laughs> there yet. Uh, the presidential office will probably release a statement on what the two leaders talked about. Uh, so no journalists Highly there. Highly likely, yeah. Yeah, all right. So let's go, now go into yeah. uh, the summit talk between Biden and uh, Xi. Sure. So that was a three, more than a three hour talk on Monday. And uh, as I said, it was the first one since Biden took office and also since Xi recently secured his third term as Chinese leader. And uh, they only had video conferences or phone talks. Based on Biden's words after the meeting and the White House's statement, it looks like the two leaders were open and straightforward towards each other, expressed their respective interests, were nowhere near resolving any of the wide range of issues Washington and Beijing disagree with each other, but 
fears of a new Cold War seem to have cooled. Uh, Biden uh, also said that he doesn't think there is any imminent attempt by China to invade Taiwan. Uh, The Taiwan issue, however, was a point that Biden made, according to the White House, which said he laid out in detail that the one China policy has not changed and that the world has an interest in maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, The U.S. leader also raised concerns over China's human rights issues, including China's treatments of the Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities. What she and Biden were on the same page on was that a nuclear war should never be fought and can never be won. And that was in regards to threats of nuclear weapons used in Ukraine. One topic that's in particular uh, interest to South Korea is North Korea, and uh, which, uh, compared to all other matters, is an area the two countries could yeah. cooperate more in. Biden said he called on his counterpart to dissuade North Korea from test-firing nuclear missiles, uh, saying that this is China's obligation, but added it's difficult to determine whether Beijing has the capacity to actually convince North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's China's obligation Uh, Mm. that they stop North Korea from testing nuclear weapons. Uh, It's not like China controls uh, North Korea. Uh, I mean, they have some influence. I think they could certainly, they can say they have a role in trying to dissuading them, uh, persuading them from uh, testing nuclear weapons. Because as I've mentioned, China does not like North Korea's nuclear weapons test or any kind of these uh, uh, provocations because the more they start acting up and there's more nuclear activities or missile activities on the Korean Peninsula, it just puts more U.S. forces in the area and China does not like this. And so luckily, at least you know, luckily for South Korea, I mean, this is the one area of uh, discussion that uh, you know both the U.S. and China can certainly agree on, uh, trying to get North Korea to s- stop testing their nuclear weapons or stop developing their nuclear weapons. But um, it's interesting that you know they still brought up like the human rights stuff, and I don't know how China, how Xi Jinping responded to that, but uh, probably said that doesn't exist, none of that stuff exists, and so forth. But um, at least for now, like you said, so it is good to see that they've. You know, the the possibility of another Cold War has uh, cooled down here. Uh, But Chinese President Xi Jinping conveying to Biden uh, that uh, concerns regarding North Korean nuclear issues need to be addressed according to the Chinese uh, foreign press, uh, foreign ministry as well. So, uh, Chi, what exactly are they talking about here? Right. So, uh, moving on to the stances of China regarding the summit. According to Beijing, China's foreign ministry said on Tuesday that sta- State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi told reporters that uh, she delivered the stance of expressing concerns over the current North Korean nuclear issues during this summit with Biden on Monday. Uh, Wang said she had stressed the need to determine the source of the problems surrounding the Korean Peninsula and address the concerns of each related party, mainly what he termed the North's reasonable woes in a balanced Mm. manner. Mm. And Wang's remark drew attention for explicitly mentioning the North, unlike Beijing's statement on the summit released a day earlier that didn't really specifically refer to North Korea or North Korea's nuclear issue or even the Korean Peninsula. So such remarks were made uh, by Minister Wang when he was asked the question what kind of exchanges that the U.S. and Chinese leaders have regarding the Ukraine crisis as well as the u- nuclear issue on the Korean Peninsula. And observers say that in delivering such a stance to Biden, uh, she sought to refrain from directly targeting the U.S. while shielding Pyongyang. And other than mentioning North Korea-related issues, she also mentioned the need for the world to join efforts to maintain the stability of the industrial network as well as supply chains uh, and prevent a large-scale humanitarian crisis from occurring. And Wang also said that she mentioned during the meeting that Taiwan is part of China and the matter is strictly internal. Uh, And a wide range of topics were touched upon as well during the summit, including human rights issues, uh, the development of systems within the two countries and the economy and the trade front. And you were curious as to how China responded to regarding the human rights issues Mm -hmm. that U.S. uh, raised concern over. Well, China defended uh, those remarks saying that it calls what it's doing right now a Chinese-style democracy. In- interesting <laughs> democracy. Uh, I, you know, the remarks uh, in regards to uh, the source of the problem surrounding the Korean Peninsula, that is probably uh, 
uh, the the best Chinese answer you can get without really irking North Korea, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the thing that China is doing. They can clearly state that they're uh, against nuclear weapons tests and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to make it sound like they're fully in favor of the United States mm-hmm. because, I mean, technically China and North Korea, they're still kind of allies. But I love how they re- said um, uh, we have to address the concerns of each related party, mainly the North's reasonable woes uh, in a balanced manner. Basically saying that, listen, you have to kind of look at why North Korea is really upset right now and why they're threatening to test the nuclear weapons. I think maybe it's because you guys are holding all these military drills, uh, you know, the United States and South Korea. So maybe uh, kind of ease up on that stuff and uh, North Korea is not going to do it. So again, uh, very political. Uh, it really shows, uh, I, I, I thought that was a very strategic comment uh, mm-hmm. remarked by China there. But it is interesting to see both Washington stance on the, uh, the summit and then now Beijing's uh, side of this. Uh, now that we heard both sides uh, and their version of the summit, let, let's delve deeper into the meeting of this summit. So let's get an analysis of this. Uh, well, the, 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 the meeting was largely meaningful in terms of uh, the situation the two sides are finding themselves in right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, first, the fact that it took place at a time when strategic competition between the two superpowers was getting fierce. And while a Cold War structure with the U.S. and Western nations on one side and Russia and China on the other appeared to be evolving. Also, uh, what was fueling the competition between the two countries was that the Biden administration administration last month in its national security strategy uh, report uh, from October said that the U.S. considers China as, quote, the only country with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the power to advance that objective. And it also referred to China as the only one challenger uh, uh, to the U.S. Uh, Then uh, there was also the uh, visit to Taiwan by uh, Nancy Pelosi, House Mm -hmm. Speaker, and uh, also the other aspect is that both two sides just recently strengthened their grounds with Xi securing his third term in office and also in uh, as for Biden following the U.S. midterm elections, uh, the win by the Democratic Party. So the significance of this uh, first big diplomatic engagement uh, after strengthening their power is what... Um, experts are looking at here. Uh, But the outcome itself uh, of the summit didn't really bear much fruit. But from the first place, there weren't that high expectations, which is obvious given the two sides have so many tensions stacked up since uh, 2020. So there seems to be just more meaning in that they actually got together for talks. And uh, here's a uh, I found this um, uh, wraps it up nicely. Uh, A former White House chief of staff said uh, if the result of this meeting is to put the relationship back on a more diplomatic plane in which instead of beating each other up, they can begin a dialogue on the kind of issues that need to be dealt with. I think this meeting could very well be pivotal. I mean, again, I mean, if the two world powers can just kind of, you know, sit together, sit down together for talks and say, listen, let's work things out uh, with, you know, that Spider-Man quote that I say all the time. Uh, with great powers come great responsibility and they just work out all their differences and things like that. It'll be great. I think they could also work out the no- the North Korea nuclear issues. Uh, but you're right. I mean, f- what what did we expect out of the first sit down, right, between the two leaders here? The good thing is it didn't go crazy and uh, they weren't exchanging blows at each other. Uh, hopefully we'll have uh, more discussions on this. Again, diplomacy wins and uh, hopefully we'll see the two leaders sit down for talks once again. Uh, in the meantime, the UN General Assembly has approved the a resolution uh, calling for the Russia to be uh, held accountable for violating international law by invading Ukraine. And this uh, includes paying reparations for the damage and loss of life during the war. So, Chi, let's, let's hear more about this. Sure. So the U.N. General Assembly passed a resolution on Monday calling for Russia to pay reparations to Ukraine over the war uh, that Moscow launched on its neighbor back in February. And the resolution passed by 193 members also demands that Russia be held accountable for any violations of international law in or against Ukraine. Uh, 94 countries, including Turkey, uh, voted in favor of the resolution, 14 voted against it, and 74 abstained. And Russia, China, Iran, and Syria were among the member states that opposed the resolution. 
Uh, the resolution also called for establishing an international mechanism for reparations for damage, loss, or injury arising from these wrongful acts of Russia against Ukraine. And it also recommends the creation of an international register of damage to serve as a record uh, in a documentary form so that it can be used as evidence. So it claims information on damage, loss, or injury to all natural and legal persons concerned and argues for promoting and coordinating, uh, coordinating ev- evidence gathering. And although General Assembly resolutions are not legally binding, they carry huge political weight and pose pressure on the targeted country. Uh, and to date, the UN has passed four resolutions condemning Russian r- aggression in Ukraine. And Ukraine's uh, ambassador to the UN told the General Assembly, quote-unquote, 77 years ago, the Soviet Union demanded and received reparations, calling it a moral right of a country that has suffered war and occupation. And today, Russia, who claims to be the successor of the 20th century's tyranny, is doing everything it can do to avoid paying the price for its war and occupation, trying to escape accountability for the crimes it is committing, uh, and said that Russia will fail, just like it's failing in the battlefield right now. But then Russia strongly opposed the resolution uh, and the ambassador to the UN, the Russian ambassador to the UN, argued that some countries are abusing the UN's power and trying to use the UN as a judicial branch. And many of the content in the resolution were illegal and invalid under international law. I mean, (laughs) Russia did invade Ukraine and um, it was a a war that shouldn't have happened uh, in the first place. But like you said, I mean, this... The UN resolution, it, it's not legally binding. It's its more symbolic than anything. And it's basically trying to show uh, how many countries are in favor mm-hmm. of punishing uh, Russia. But here's the thing, even if there are, and, and you know what, talks of reparation, um, there is going to be no reparation being paid by Russia right off the bat. If there, the war ends right now, Okay, Uh, and they're going to ask for Russia's reparation. That's not going to be given Putin. There is absolutely no way that Putin is going to pay reparation. But what could happen later on is, though, let's say years down the road and and Putin's no longer in power and maybe they have a different government. Uh, Maybe that government, you know, might kind of open up and say that, listen, you know what the previous uh, government did, uh, what the country did, Russia did uh, at the time invading Ukraine uh, was wrong and we're going to pay reparation. Maybe then it's going to happen. But right off the bat, it's not going to happen. That's the frustrating thing about a lot of these resolutions is it's more symbolic than anything. It's not legally binding and it doesn't do much. But the message is uh, certainly clear. Uh, Guys, let's move on to the health front and... uh, uh, it's always kind of very frustrating when we thought that we we're, weren't going to be covering any COVID-19 stuff on focus on headline, meaning that uh, COVID-19 was kind of a uh, thing of the past anymore. But uh, now what we're seeing is we're certainly seeing a significant uptick in uh, COVID-19 cases. And this is very concerning because now it's winter season, it's getting colder, uh, flu season in as well, twindemic. Uh, there's talks of other variants, subvariants popping up as well. So uh, give us the figures here. Sure. So over 70,000 is now the daily caseload we're seeing. Uh, to be exact, 72,883 infections were posted as of 12 a.m. this Tuesday. That's a threefold surge from yesterday. I mean, we usually have lower numbers on Monday, but still, it's quite a surge. Uh, yesterday, we had around 49,000. Uh, and a week ago on Tuesday, uh, compared to today's number, we had around 16,000 less cases a week ago. And two weeks ago, it was some 14,000 cases, uh, fewer cases. So it seems to be an increase uh, in recent weeks. And it's also for the first time in around two months that we're at the 70,000 level. It's also the highest Tuesday figure in 10 weeks. Um, In the meantime, 50 infections were posted from uh, abroad. Mm -hmm. Why did you look up that? Oh, no, no, because uh, (laughs) over Uh 70,000 from around 49,000 oh. it's not threefold cuz Oh, where did that come from? Yeah, I thought I thought I misunderstood Thanks for folds checking that. all these years cuz it means three times, right? Yeah. And so I was like, wait, am I not understanding what folds are all about? But I'll uh, check in a bit where I that think, came I th- from. I think you meant like 3,000 or something or there's a threefold increase from like a month like months ago Maybe. or something. Maybe I'll check yeah. that. Okay. Thanks for that. So, uh in the meantime, we have 412 people 
remaining in serious or critical condition and 39 fatalities uh, reported in the past day. And uh, also, because we are seeing this resurgence, um, health officials are calling on people to get vaccinated, especially as many uh, the the immunity has waned uh, in many cases, especially for seniors. Uh, they are asking them to get their fourth shot, mm. uh, especially those above 70 years old. Everyone should uh, get their extra shots is what authorities are uh, calling on right now. Uh, currently, the vaccination uh, figures uh, for this um, for the extra additional shots stands at 3.7 percent. Uh, so you can see that. Not many people are yeah. getting their uh, additional shots. And then in case of those uh, age 60 and above, it's at 10.8%. Uh, uh, yes, uh, so that's uh, the latest on the Korean uh COVID-19 front. Yeah, and uh, from what I understand, and, you know, we talked about the pandemic, right, yeah. uh, which means uh, it, it's flu season right now, it's seasonal flu, and we kind of look at some of the other countries and mm. how they're dealing with it and to see how it could potentially happen to us here in South Korea. And what we're hearing is that the U.S. is dealing with one of its worst flu seasons right now. Right, it is. Uh, in fact, the number of flu patients in the U.S. seems to be at its highest in around a decade. Uh, according to the CDC on Thursday local time, uh, in this year's season, if they say season, I believe it starts with uh, uh, maybe uh, September or October. It didn't really state mm -hmm. uh, when the season started. But in this season, at least 2.8 billion people uh, have gotten ill with the flu and uh, 23,000 have been hospitalized and 1,300 people have lost their lives from Jeez. the seasonal flu. Yes, uh, and especially the southeast was hit hardest. And uh, more than 6,400 people uh, were admitted to the hospital with the flu during the week ending on November 5th, uh, also according to uh, health data. And yeah, so you're seeing that we're seeing this extreme uh, surge in uh, the seasonal flu. And uh, on a separate note, staying with health issues, uh, this just came in a little before our show. Uh, in Korea, the third monkeypox uh, patient has been confirmed uh, this um, Tuesday. Uh, it looks to be a Korean citizen who entered Korea from the Arab Emirates. Yeah, uh, we, I, I was, our uh, writer was uh, telling me about this story and uh, I had completely forgotten mm -hmm. that uh, monkeypox issue was a big thing earlier this year. But uh, just kind of going back to the, the flu, uh, I know a large number of people die every year because of the flu, uh, but it's gotten to the point where they just, I don't think they really count, uh, count uh, the fatality from uh, flu because it's become such a norm, right? And that's what we're saying about COVID-19 is later on, who knows, COVID-19 might be something that we're just going to have every year. Uh, it's going to be an endemic. And so we're not even going to count anymore. But that is a staggering figure when you're talking about whatever that season is, wherever it starts, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. I think, you know, a thousand was a thousand plus uh, people that have died from flu. That's, that's a staggering number there. Uh, in the meantime, following the reform of the existing healthcare insurance system to a two tier system starting in September, uh, many dependents have been dropped with the conditioned uh, strengthened conditions uh, beginning in December. An additional number of people will be eliminated from the current pool of beneficiaries. Chi, what are we talking about here? Right. So uh, before I update you on this reform of the uh, health insurance, okay. uh, I know that SJ and Seoul, you're both foreigners, but you are local subscribers and you pay insurance yes. premium in Seoul, right? Right. And from, I, from what I understand, is it more expensive for foreigners than the... I think it's here? got pretty expensive in the recent years since they made it mandatory for mm -hmm. uh, foreigners, for every foreigner to subscribe. But right. it also depends on how, how much, much you make. You right, you know, right. Like of course. Because, yeah. you know, so I'm, you pay so the... much more than I do <laughs> in uh, this insurance, so I wouldn't know. Right. That's not a fact. <laughs> Right. I mean, like how much you pay, like you said, depends on your income right, and right, your right. property, et cetera. Well, according to the health ministry and the National Health Insurance Service, every November, these authorities, they examine data such as uh, the income growth rate of the previous year, such as like interest, dividend, earned income, of course, and even housing rental income. And the rate of increase in the property tax of uh, buildings, houses, lands, uh, ships, et cetera, for the same year to 
to see if individuals' income and property have increased. And if they exceed a certain level, they're converted to local subscribers from what we call the dependent, and local insurance premiums are levied in uh, December of that year. So as a result, 273,000 people were excluded from the dependents' pool due to the strengthening of this income standard uh, following the reform back in September. And those whose income increased last year or whose or whose uh, property increase this year will also lose their qualification because they do not meet the income or property standards and will have to pay their premiums uh, in December. And dependents are people who depend mainly on their children or their other family members who have jobs and earn money uh, because these dependents alone cannot make ends meet and enjoy insurance benefits without paying the insurance premiums. Uh, And to be qualified as a dependent, you must meet the income and property standard as well as the support requirements standard set by the health insurance authority. But there have been much controversy surrounding the qualification of these dependents uh, because many of them, without paying a penny, enjoy the uh, insurance benefits despite having financial capabilities through other sources other than labor, such as properties and other types of assets. And we've uh, gone through before and uh, with the strengthened standard, many who are affor- who can afford to pay the premiums will be paying them starting December. Yeah, I I, I don't know what happened with me, but uh, <laughs> I I'm paying less now. Uh, they said, listen, I think we have to give you a discount. I don't know if they feel bad about me or something, or uh, I don't know that my property has went down. I don't think my property went down. Something happened. I'm not making enough money. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but I'm certainly paying less than what I used to last year. Uh, but uh, it is uh, it is pretty expensive though, and uh, yeah. So are you gonna boast about your high insurance? No, not at all. I just <laughs> want to make a correction on my COVID uh, figure okay. earlier. It was actually a threefold jump from yesterday, but it was by uh, it was a, the difference was at forty nine thousand. So yesterday's case was at just twenty three thousand something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I today, did. with being seventy thousand something, it really was a threefold. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to say. I was like, I did, I did the COVID num- numbers yesterday. I didn't think it was forty nine thousand. Mm. But I mean, I'm old. I don't remember stuff. But uh, (laughs) anyways, guys, thank you very much for coming in today with your report. Stay safe as always. See you guys again. Thank you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.